I'm here to talk to you guys about magical thinking. Um, it might seem like an odd topic to talk about here on this college campus where we value analytical thinking, logic, and reason. I'm also a chemistry major, so my chemistry professors, you know, emphasize using evidence and data to support my claims. They think it's a little silly, maybe even a little odd, that, you know, I try sweet-talking my experience into working sometimes. Um, and, but what I'm here to tell you guys is that magical thinking is everywhere and that it's important and even necessary in our lives. I would like to define magical thinking as the belief that one's thoughts, words, or actions will produce an outcome which defies the normal laws of cause and effect. Um, one great example of this are superstitions, right? And so in the Western world, um, adults often relegate you know, belief in superstition or magical thinking to the likes of children. It's considered irrational and even immature. This is an idea that PJ, one of like, the founding figures of developmental psychology, popularized. This idea that we grew out of magical thinking. But I don't think that's necessarily true. I think adults, even from the Western world, readily engage in such superstitious behaviors. Um, and so I grabbed a couple of examples off of, examples of superstitions off of the popular website Reddit. And so example number one is an age-old theater superstition, right? It's, if you say Macbeth in a theater, horrible, horrible things will happen. I actually think I might have broken that superstition since I'm in a theater right now, and I definitely just said that word. So if something horrible does happen, my bad. Um, <laughs> example number two, I'm a grad student in biology. Talking to your experiments gives you better results. As a chemistry major and as someone that has been involved in research, that one kind of speaks to me, right? Like when my cells aren't growing, I kind of ask them, could you please grow? And I ask them kind of nicely, and sometimes it works. Can't really explain that one. Um, example number three, the radio, the radio volume better not be a prime number in my car or I'm going to get into a wreck. I hate odd numbers. I don't really know why, but you know, when I played sports in high school, I always wore an even number jersey because I felt more lucky that way. It was kind of an irrational, magical thinking, superstitious kind of thing. And so sometimes people think that, you know, as we grow older, as we become more educated, we become more immune to superstition or magical belief. But I don't think education necessarily precludes belief in magic either. Um, even at Williams, it's a very you know, rigorous institution. One of the smartest kids I know is my friend Peter Drews, who also happened to be my tutorial partner and runs track and cross country. And he was actually willing to share one of his superstitions as well. Every night before big races or just any race, uh, any cross country or track races, one of my superstitions is to run in my, in my jersey my race jersey um, the night before in the mirror. I put on my jersey, get all ready to race mentally. It helps me to picture my race and what I'm gonna do. And it makes me really uneasy if I can't do that, finish that ritual. But that's just one thing that keeps me going for, for races. And so here, I think you see kind of a range of magical belief, right? So on one end of the spectrum, there are people that are involved in theater that really honestly believe if you call the Scottish play by its real name, you know, <laughs> someone's gonna get injured or you know, the production's gonna go bankrupt or some other horrible thing will happen, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum, there are people like my friend Peter who kind of understand that you know, running in front of a mirror the night before his meet isn't really gonna affect his performance at his meet the next day. But as he said himself, it makes him a little uneasy, right? It throws his game off a little bit. And so I think regardless of where we fall exactly on this range or spectrum of magical belief, we all, uh, most of us, you know, engage in some form of it in one way or another. And so I want to argue that, you know, magical thinking is often an integral aspect of our thought process and that there's an important balance between kind of our rational side and our irrational side of our minds. And so if you think about this, magical thinking is actually quite old, right? Especially relative to what we consider modern scientific reasoning. That's only a recent phenomenon in human history. There's this great quote by a psychologist, a leading psychologist in this field, Paul Harris. And to paraphrase it, it's this idea that if you think about the entire history of mankind in a period of 24 hours, scientific reasoning has only really developed in the last minute of the last hour of our history. And so if you look you know, in the modern era, and if you look into certain cultures, certain communities, we find that there's a strong uh, propensity towards teleological reasoning. What teleological reasoning is, is seeing a purpose or a reason behind an object or an event. An example of this is you know, witnessing a hurricane and being like, that hurricane is because God is pissed off, right? That's a form of magical thinking. And so, <clears throat> and so we're kind of hardwired for this. We're hardwired for magical thinking. And the big question becomes why. And one hypothesis is that perhaps it gives us a sense of control 
over what is inherently uncontrollable. And so what I mean by this is there's an extensive amount of research that has been done that shows that when we're stressed, we feel uh, we lose the sense of control we have over our lives. I think most of us can kind of relate to this feeling, perhaps, at Williams, right, where it's very rigorous, um, in the face of overwhelming deadlines, right? We feel a little helpless. We feel like we're not in control of our situation. And so magical thinking might be a way to kind of reestablish that sense of control that is lost during stress. And so there's a landmark study that was done during the first Gulf War that kind of supports this hypothesis. They look, uh, these researchers looked at participants who lived in regions that were exposed to missile attacks, right, which would be a very high stress scenario. And they looked at participants from regions that were not exposed to missile attacks, missile attacks, which would be a low stress scenario. And they found that there was a higher prevalence of magical thinking and superstitious behaviors in the, re in the regions that were exposed to missile attacks, the high stress scenario, right? And the beauty of this study is that we don't really need missiles raining down our homes to feel stressed out, right? Modern life, daily life, is stressful enough without the missiles raining down our homes. You know, we have traffic, commute, um, sickness, due dates, all of these stresses can kind of trigger a form of magical thinking. And so, for me personally, I'm from Virginia, right? And it doesn't snow very often down there, unlike here in Bloomstown, Massachusetts, right? And um, when I was in high school and I saw that there was a 30 to 35% chance of snow, you know, I'd put on my pajamas and do the little snow dance, right, and try to get it to snow. And there's no rational reason for me to think that putting on my pajamas and making a fool out of myself will kind of influence the snow particles up into clouds and make it snow a blizzard and cancel school for a week. But I was stressed out about school. I didn't want to do my homework. I didn't want to go to school and sit there for eight hours a day, right? And so putting on my pajamas and dancing was kind of a way to make me feel like I was in control of that situation. I was in the way of coping with that stress of school. Another example is I'm actually uh, starting the process of applying to med school and my mom has been really worried and so she's been praying for me every day. And I don't want to discredit the validity or the importance of religion, but, and you know, this is really unfortunate for me, but there's no scientific paper saying that, you know, my mom's prayers will get me into med school, right? <laughs> as nice as that would be because my mom is a fantastic prayer. <laughs> Um, but regardless of any kind of scientific support for prayers, right, I think most of us have engaged in some form of prayers in one way or another. And I think prayers are actually a great example of how we can, is a great example of a form of magical thinking that we utilize to kind of gain a sense of control over what are inherently ungovernable events that can happen in our lives. And so I think this sense of control is important. I think that there are measurable benefits that come from the sense of control and magical thinking. And so there was a recent study done that looked at participants who were given a good luck related superstition, uh, whether it was something verbal or physical like a lucky charm. And what they found was that these participants who were given a good luck related superstition showed improved performances in golfing, motor dexterity tests, anagram games, and memory tests. And when they actually kind of looked into this further and delved into it further, they found that these participants who engaged in good luck-related superstitions had higher levels of confidence. And that makes sense, right? Because when we're more confident, we, we're able to perform at a higher level. And I think we can even tie that confidence back into this idea of having a sense of control, right? Because when we feel like we're in control of a situation, we feel more confident about that situation as well. And so athletes are actually a great demonstration of this, right? Like my friend Peter who runs track and cross country, you know, he trains really hard. He's out there running every day. It could be minus 10 degrees out in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and I can see him run down Route 2. Um, and he trains so hard for these meets because they're, you know, they're extremely competitive, especially at the co college level. And, what's, and so because they're so competitive, there's a certain level of uncertainty to these meets. And I think for athletes like Peter who invest so much time and energy and into their training and stuff like that, it's hard for them to, you know, it's stressful for them to think that these games are, you know, there's a certain level of uncertainty that they can't prepare for. And so I think magical thinking or superstitious behaviors is a way to cope with that stress of uncertainty, right? So Peter runs in front of the mirror because it helps him cope with, you know, knowing that, you know, the meat can't go exactly as he predicted, right, the night before. And so it gives him that kind of con uh, confidence and it helps him perform consistently at a high level. And so I think magical thinking is not just some inconsequential creation of our irrational minds. It's, I think our irrational thought processes are actually very important, right? So if we thought about everything from a purely rational point of view, we would lose out on some of the benefits of our irrationalities. We would lose out on that perceived sense of control, the improved confidence, and the improved performance. 
But you know, if you engage in everything from an irrational point of view, right? If you engage in too much magical thinking, for example, um, we uh, well, that can be the basis of obsessive compulsive disorder, right? Turning on the lights three, four, or five times before you enter a room. It can come to a point where it starts really hindering the quality of your life. It's also important to ground yourself in reality sometimes, right? So it's important for me to know, you know, my rational side of my brain tells me, you know, when I talk to med school committees or something, be like, oh, hey, like, I shouldn't say, like, hey, you know, my mom has been praying for me, so you should really let me into your school. I know they, I know that they want to see hard work and good test scores, and that's my rational side of my brain. And so it's important, I think, that there's this balance between our rational and ir our irrational thought processes. And that perhaps, you know, one of the greatest things about a Western education is that we learn to utilize both our learned rational, logical, analytical thinking skills, as well as our kind of our irrational, inherent thought processes as well. And so I would kind of, I want to demonstrate this coexistence between these two processes with some card magic, right? Because card magic is, on one, side, on, on one end, right, irrationally, you guys know that it's going to be some kind of sleight of hand, so you'll be looking at my hands carefully trying to figure it out. But irrationally, you know, when the magic happens, there's an irrational enjoyment of it, right? And some of you guys might even start to question, you know, can I do magic? Am I Harry Potter or whatnot? <laughs> and so if I could actually get a volunteer. Any, so I have a deck of cards, and... Could you just pick a card for me, please? Just any card you, you're choosing. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Let's take it out. You can show the audience what your card is. You can also look at, I mean, yeah, you've already seen it. But. <laughs> you can also actually show me. This is the part that people think it's weird, but I've already seen sure. this happen before, so I already know what's going to happen. You yeah, you can show me the card. You're actually going to sign it for me, the seven of clubs. So, or you could just put your initials or whatever. Just mark it as yours. Oh, sorry, what was your name? Dan. Dan. And so what Dan did for me was that he signed this card, right? And so this makes it pretty unique. There are no other cards like, there's no other seven of clubs like this in the world, right? And we're also going to, you know, just because our, my talk is about magical thinking, I'm going to call this card magical thinking, okay? And so what we're going to do with magical thinking is, what we usually do is, we keep it locked up, right? We keep it caged. And so I'm going to keep Dan's uh, unique seven of cl clubs, his uh, magical thinking, locked up in this card case right here. And so I'm going to ask Dan to hold on to this, actually, for me. Make sure magical thinking doesn't escape, because, you know, God forbid, at a college campus, we're not doing something analytical thinking or some logic and reason, right? And so I'm going to choose a card as well. I'm going to choose this card, the Four of Diamonds. It and I'm going to have this represent analytical thinking, the stuff that our professors love, right? When we write our papers, they want us to use logic and reason, right? And so I'm going to take um, logical thinking, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to do what you did, OK? I'm going to actually sign it. So do you mind? Mm -hmm. And that way, we make this card unique as well, and so, right? So now it has my, or it has my initials on it, at least. And so now I'm going to ask Dan to just you make sure magical thinking is still caged in, right? And to just stick it out just like this a little bit. You can, you can hold on to it just so we can make sure it doesn't come out. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to give it a quick one. Did you see that? Magical thinking escapes, and what's in there? You can take a seat. Round of applause for Dan. Thank you. And so I just want to quickly conclude my talk with just this idea that, you know, even on though, you know, our professors might love, and, you know, it makes sense. We would drive our professors crazy if we didn't use logic and reason when we write papers or lab reports, right? And, um, but at the same time, we should embrace, you know, we shouldn't keep our magical thinking locked up or caged up. It's, all, it's an integral aspect of our thought process, and it's, you know, something that's important to us as well. Thank you. <laughs>